I want to turn our conversation to the millions of people in America right now who have filed for unemployment, the numbers are going up every day, who are in crisis, who really don't want to be sitting at home watching TV. They want to be in the workforce. They want to be back in the game. They don't know about the jobs that are available right now. And I think the very first day that we convened as a business leadership group in Dallas, we thought about the things that were most actionable to help those who are most vulnerable and who would be displaced. Let me just tell you, in my own life, I remember viscerally at 13 years old when my father lost his job and the kind of vulnerability that we felt as a family, you know, still lingers in my mind today. Will we be okay? You know, Will we come through this? Can we keep our home? Can we keep the life that we had become accustomed to? We, we partnered uh, across our community and we're partnering with your foundation to actually create an exchange uh, so that the companies that still need workers, whether it's you know McKesson, which is a huge distributor of pharmaceutical goods or Domino's Pizza, which may need more delivery drivers because more people are home and need that kind of service that, that across the spectrum of all of the things available that we could give people a direct line to those companies to find immediate opportunities if they need them. I'm excited to share the Word of God with you. I want you to open your hearts and open your mind as we prepare to go into the Word of God, believing God to speak to us in a special way. And our thing today, the scripture I'm going to use is John 4, 20 through 24, very common scripture. John 4, 20 through 24. Reach out and grab it real quick. Ooh, that song is still ringing. We're down toward the end of the story of the woman at the well, and there's just a few fragments of scriptures I, I want to read. Our fathers, beginning at verse 20, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. They worshiped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem, oh my God, worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Can you say amen? I want to talk to you from the subject, gleanings from the well. Gleanings from the well. Let's pray. Father, sanctify your word deep down in our hearts and in our spirits. Let the word be made flesh while it's being ministered today. I thank you because it is your word that gives life today. Bless your people as only you can. In Jesus' name, somebody shout amen. You may be seated. I want to talk a little bit to you about this, uh, this occurrence that happens down at the well. And I'm particularly interested in the worship aspect of it, but I'm going to start uh, upwards from there with the well itself. I'm going to point to the fact that this is a Samaritan woman, which we kind of read over and pay no particular attention to because depending on what area you're watching this from, we have other cultures and other issues and other uh, sociological constructs that consume our understanding of life. Uh, if I said that, that she was a jihadist, if I said that she was uh, a, a member of this group or that group or the other, uh, or a Muslim or a, a Jewish rabbi or this or that, with these are more contemporary understandings we have of sociological constructs and the terrorists thereof. But when we say that she's a Samaritan woman, it doesn't really stand out to us. But in Jesus' day, it was a big deal. It was a really big deal. It was such a big deal when Jesus was teaching 
uh, and, and his teaching was contested by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the lawyers came to them and asked him, he, Jesus said, love that. He said, there are two commandments, that you love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy mind and soul, that's number one. Number two, that you love your neighbor as yourself. And the, then the lawyers desiring to trip him up in his own law came to him, cross-examined him and said, who is my neighbor? And Jesus starts this big discussion uh, uh, about a certain man went down from Jericho to Jerusalem from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell amongst thieves who stripped him and wounded him and left him half dead. The Levites came and, and then uh, the priests came and, and they all turned away and finally uh, the, the good, the good, the good, the good Samaritan. The good Samaritan? Really? Yeah, the good Samaritan. If there's a good Samaritan, then there's a bad Samaritan, you know? It's, it's, like, it's like saying, I don't like black people, but Fred is okay, okay? So there's a little bit of hint in this whole narrative of Good Samaritan that speaks to how the Jews felt about the Samaritans. The likelihood that you would end up needing the help of a Samaritan. See, we get caught up in the help that he gave and the service that he gave and putting the man on the beast and carrying him to the end and taking care of him. And that's a great story. It's a wonderful story. But we overlook the, the, the discord that exists between the Jews and the Samaritan. Jesus has so broadened the definition of neighbor that he is showing them that God doesn't have to use somebody who shares your faith or your theology or the color of your skin to bless you, that sometimes God will use the good Samaritan. He will take somebody out of another people group that you don't normally hang with or run around with and make them your neighbor. And Jesus is trying to dispel any attitude that they might have of being elite or special or different or better or set apart from or those other people over there or this group over there. He has brought them down to an understanding that everybody is your neighbor, that it's not a result of what area code, zip code you live in, what area code you live in, none of that matters, the color of your skin, not even your theology, that God can use anybody to bless you. And yet, we are the most segregated people. Yeah. Dr. King says the 11 o'clock hour is the most segregated hour in the, in the country, in the United States. 50 some years later, it still remains true today in most circles. Uh, and when it is integrated, it's generally integrated in one direction. And, and there's still a problem with a connected, not only racially, connecting outside of our theological construct. They're, they're not from our denomination. They don't believe what we believe. They're Calvinists, they're this. They're, we got all these kind of names that justify our reason for not being connected. There is a reason that Jesus said, I must need go through Samaria. He said, I'm not going to go around something that you go around, I'm going into Samaria. I'm going across the tracks. I'm going into the neighborhood that you maybe wouldn't hang out in. I'm going to Samaria. And there he finds a woman. I don't know the name of the woman, but I know the, the, the ethnicity of the woman. Isn't it funny that we learn more? The Bible thinks it's more important for us to know that she's a Samaritan than it is to know whether her name is Helen or Mary or, or Rosine or uh, Shaquanda. It doesn't matter about that. What matters is that we understand is that Jesus has gone to Samaria and he must need. He said, I have a need, a compelling drive to go to people you avoid. And he goes to her at the well. And I want to talk just a minute about the well, the, the symbolism of the well. There's so much to be said here. The, the symbolism of the well is the first preview to the fact that the one thing both the Jews and the Samaritans had in common was thirst. It's, it's also the meeting place. No matter whether you were rich or poor, you had to go to the well. You must realize that cities were built or not built based on their access to water. If there were no well or there were no ocean or there were no river nearby to irrigate a city, then the whole city would have to move based on where there were the well. If the wells dried up, the people would have to migrate into different areas. So the well really controlled the lifestyle of the people. The shepherds needed it. The sheep needed it. The kings needed it. The paupers needed it. It didn't matter what sociological station of life you were in, you always came to the well. And it is just like God to meet us at the place that we all have a need. 
to go to something that we have in common rather than to go to something that divides us. Jesus comes to something that unites us. There's something to be said about that because he could have stayed in Jerusalem and stayed in the sanctuary or went to the temple and stayed in something that divided us. No, 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 no. He comes down to the well because everybody gets thirsty. Men get thirsty. Women get thirsty. Children get thirsty. Intellectuals get thirsty. Illiterates get thirsty. Jesus comes to the well. It is the common denominator. Today, we have excuses for not connecting. Well, you know, that's not my demo. That's not my group. They don't seem to respond to me. We don't sing like that. They stay in church too long. They're too short. They're too quiet. They're too loud. They're too this. They're too, shut up a minute. Jesus comes to the well. He comes to what we have in common. He comes to what connects us. He comes to what unites us. He comes to the place of our need. He comes to the place of our need. And in this particular case, it is down to the well. And there at the well, he sits. He sits down and waits at the well because sooner or later, yeah. <laughs> no matter how much you got and how much you own and what you drive and where you live, sooner or later, you won't have to come down to this well. Sooner or later, you may be the professor or the student, but sooner or later, you may be the judge or the criminal, but sooner or later, you may be the police officer, you may be the burglar. Sooner or later, everybody had to come down to the well. So Jesus sat down at the well and he waited for humanity to recognize its thirst. To recognize its thirst. Because thirst is something that you have to recognize. You don't always recognize your thirst. You, 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 have you ever been thirsty and you didn't even realize you were thirsty and all of a sudden you say, wait a minute, I'm thirsty. I need, well, you have to come into the word. So I want to go from the well to talking about the water because there's something, the whole thing starts about water. You're sitting on a well, the conversation starts about water. And here's what's weird about it. When the conversation starts about water, it doesn't start out with the woman talking about being thirsty, though she's obviously thirsty or she wouldn't have been at the well. It starts out talking about Jesus' thirst. And he says to her, I thirst, give me the drink. And, and, and she says, you know, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You have nothing to draw with. I'm suspicious. You come down to the well, you have nothing to draw with. And he says to her, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for water. And all of a sudden we begin to see this galvanizing around water. And so I want to take a minute and talk about water. Because the first thing we see in the creation is water. Before we see trees or before we see birds or before we see anything else, the first thing we see in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the face of the deep. What is the deep? The deep is water. The first thing we see is water. Our body is at least 70% composite of water. The first thing we recognize is water. We're composed of water. We need water. We thirst for that which we are. <laughs> we thirst for that which we are. If we don't get that which we are, we dehydrate for the lack of what we are. Okay, so though I am comprised of water, I still need water. And I want to talk a little bit about this water because I thirst. He says, I thirst to start this conversation. We will never hear him mention his thirst again until he's hanging from a tree with nails in his hands and nails in his feet, stretched high and hung wide. There in the lurches of death and life, he stands between time and eternity. And again, we will hear him utter what he whispered to this woman, I thirst, which makes us wonder what does God thirst for? I understand that I thirst for water because I'm made of water and I need water to irrigate the water, to keep the water moving inside of me lest I dehydrate and begin to pass out. Yeah, yeah. But since we will later learn that God is a spirit, do spirits get thirsty? Wow. So I want to talk about this water because they're having this, 
conversation that we make an assumption that they both have the same kind of water, but they're not talking about the same thing. So, so she says, you don't have anything to draw with. If it, you, know, you come down to this well, you must be trying to hit on me. You must be trying to flirt with me because you came down to the well. You got nothing to draw with. I'm suspicious. He said, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for water. If I give you the drink of the water that I have, you will never thirst again. Listen to that. So he's not talking about the water that's in the well, because you can drink the water that's in the well and you're going to thirst again. But he said, if you drink of the water that I have, you will never thirst again. And then she begins the long road to humility. The road to humility is a long road. It starts with confession. And she confessed, give me this water that I thirst not. The, the humility of asking. Have, have, you, have you ever seen people who needed something and wouldn't ask you for it? Were in need, but just, just, just not go ask you. Rather pass, slap out in the floor than to ask you because they are so proud. They never learned how to humble themselves to say, give me this water that I thirst not. But Jesus sits there and waits not just for her to get a revelation of who he is and what water he has, but for her to get a revelation that makes her humble enough to put her in the vulnerable position of requesting, give me this water. There is something missing out of my life. Give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to drink. I'm, I'm tired of coming down here. I'm wondering if there's anybody that's tired of making the same trip to the same places to get the same thing that you're going to need again next week. I wonder if there's anybody tired of the cycle of your life where every morning you got to get up and go through the same thing over and over and over again. Once a week you got to go through the same thing again. I'm wondering if anybody's got a cycle, a cycle that's destroying them because you keep coming to get something that's putting a Band-Aid on something that, that doesn't get better. We all have our wills. <laughs> we have the places that we go to get some temporary relief, needing something much deeper to satisfy, but this will only pacify. The water that existed in Jacob's well would pacify, but the water that existed in Jesus would satisfy. <laughs> And I'm wondering, are you drinking the water that pacifies or the water that satisfies? So I'm calling this gleanings of the well because I don't want to really exhaust the text. I just want to glean a few principles out of the text to tell you that there are two waters that coexist at the same time. A natural water and a spiritual water are, are both present in this text. A natural well and a spiritual well are both present in this text, and this woman has come in front of both of them. It's almost like a Coke and Pepsi thing. It's a taste test, okay? She's, she's standing in front of a natural well and a spiritual well. Jesus is Jacob's well, <laughs> okay? And she can look at Jacob's well, and then she can look at Jesus and look at Jacob's well. There's Jacob's well and Jacob's well, and there's water and there's water. And she's standing in front of them. And to all of this, when she comes face to face with the water, she said, the well, we talked about the water. Now she starts making all these excuses. You know, uh, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know this, and I don't know about your doctrine, and I don't know about your theology. And people have all kinds of excuses. I don't go to this church, it's a mega church. I don't go to that church, it's a storefront. I don't go to that church, they're holding these people. I don't go to that church, uh, the church of God. I, we, we got all kind of religious dogs. The same people who got all kind of problems, strung out on drugs, hooked on all kinds of stuff, hooked to, addicted to pornography, tied up to all kinds of stuff, but, but they, they got all of these religious reasons to stop them from getting something that would quench your thirst. 
And she starts coming with all of that. And, and finally he gets tired of her and says, where is your husband? And she said, <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> she, she wanted to say, which one? Yeah, where is her husband? And, and she said, I, I have none, Lord. She didn't know how to answer him. She didn't know how to answer him because she didn't know how much he knew because she was in a situation. Some of y'all are watching right now, you're in a situation. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's complicated. It's hard to explain. It's, it's not exactly my husband. She's not my wife. It's just, it, 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 uh, well, you... But I, 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 want, I want to talk to you about a God that understands. I, 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 want, I want to talk to you about a God that when you come to him and you got something going on in your life that sounds like you have to. I, 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 I want you to know that, they, that it doesn't stop him from talking to you, that he still wants to talk to you. He wants to have a conversation with you, but he wants to show you something about yourself that you need to see. Truth, woman, you do not have one, and the one you got now is not yours. So that takes me from the well, and I talked about the well, and I talked about the water, and that takes me to the Word. He told her something about herself that was classified information. The Word of God doesn't just reveal God. The Word of God reveals you. The Word of God doesn't just help you to see God. The Word of God helps you to see yourself. The Word of God helps you to see your temper. The Word of God helps you to see your pride. The Word of God helps you to see your haughtiness. The Word of God helps you to see your self-righteousness. The Word of God helps you to see your arrogance. The Word of God helps you to see your bigotry. That's why I don't understand how you can stay in a church where you are truly getting the Word of God and yet be a bigot because the Word of God will show you yourself. I don't believe in prophets that can see everybody's sins, but they're all. The Word of God will show you yourself. And Jesus spoke to her and said, Truth, woman, you, you have none. You've had five husbands, and the one you got now is not yours. And the thing that got me, it wasn't the well that got her the most. It wasn't the water that got her, got her the most. It was the word. Because she didn't say, come see a well. She didn't say, come get some water. She dropped her water pots and ran into the streets to say, come see a man who gave me a word. He wow. told me everything I had ever done. The thing that stood out in her was not the well nor the water, it was the word. So you can't have church and not have word. You can have a good time, but until you have the word, you don't have anything that shines a light on you, and you'll never drop your water pots just singing. You got to go deeper than that and get down to a word that stands up in your face and confronts you. Come see a man who finally gave me the word. Wait a minute. Isn't this the woman that's been worshiping in the mountain for years? How in the world could you be worshiping in the mountain for years? And you have no word. What kind of worship have you been having that never revealed God and never revealed you? You've been worshiping in the mountain. No wonder Jesus said, you know not what. Because you've been worshiping in the mountain for years and you never got a word. And what good is worship without a word? For it is the word that convicts it. It is the word that transforms. It is the word, my brothers and sisters, that is in fact the very sperm of God. It is the semen of God. It is how God impregnates the human spirit is by his word. His word, his word. The Bible said that when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 36, they, they heard Peter preach the word of God. Verse 38, they were pricked in their hearts. They were penetrated in their heart. It's not the word that falls on you. It's the word that falls in you. When the word gets in you, you become pregnated with the word of God. The moment the word got in them, it changed their behavior. They said, now what must we do? 
And he told them, repent and be baptized, every one of you. See, once the word gets in, it changes your attitude. No wonder the woman dropped her water pots because she didn't need them anymore. She got a word from God. Come see a man who told me everything I'd ever done. He illuminated me. He helped me see myself. He transformed me. He changed my life. I'll never be the same again because I came down to the well to get some water. And instead he gave me a word. This association between water and word will continue itself throughout Scripture. For the Bible says you are clean by the washing of water by the word. Yes, sir. That it is water, word, water, yeah. word. You are clean yeah. by the washing of water of the word. Then the Bible says there are three that bear record in earth, the spirit, the water, and the word. And these three agree in one. Agree. Yeah. yeah. So you can't have spirit and not have word. The entrance of thy word giveth light. Yes, sir. Yeah, you said that too. The entrance of thy word giveth light. That's how you know you get word when you get light. When you get word, you will get light. When you get word, you will get light. That's why the first thing God says is let there be light. Uh, and there was light and it was good because there's an association between word and light. The entrance of thy word giveth light. When you get real good teaching, light comes on on you. You are down in your spirit. You start to see everything different because the word illuminates. Job said, I'd rather have it than my necessary food. If I don't get anything to eat, I got to get this word. I esteem it more important than my food. David said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. John said, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the wonder of his glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The soldier said, you don't need to come to my house. Speak the word only and my daughter shall be here. The word, I don't need you to come. But if you speak a word, it'll change everything. Jesus didn't lay hands on Lazarus. He didn't pour oil on Lazarus' casket. He sent his word in the grave and said, Lazarus, come forth. And the word reached in there and snatched him out of the grave. God's word, the word that the Bible said would not return to be boys, but to do that thing wrong to I send it to do. My word won't fail. If I send it out, it will get you. It will reel you in. It'll pull you back. No wonder she said, come see a man who gave me a word. Come see a man. They asked me all the time, well, and what is it about you that people follow you? I said, nothing. Nothing special about me. Just a country old hick boy from the hills of West Virginia, born on the side of a house whose daddy was a janitor and mama was a teacher. There's nothing great about me. Everything great is about the word. Because wow. if you give the word and you put out the word right, if you put out the kind of word that causes people to see themselves or see hope for tomorrow or see healing for themselves, then you don't have to beg them to come. You never have to beg birds to eat bread. If you put the bread out, the birds are going to come on their own. You don't have to drop bread and say, hey, little birdies, come, birdies, come. Come on, little birdies, come on, little birdies, come on, little birdies. No, shut up and just throw the bread out. If you throw the bread, the word says they'll come, the birds will come. The Bible said the word increased and the disciples multiplied. Where the word increases, the disciples will multiply. And who would have thought that this, forgive me, this tramp, this woman of ill repute, this husband snatching tramp of a woman, who would have thought that the word would hit her too? That she would be a disciple. That she'd be a disciple, a woman that all the other women were whispering about, a woman that she didn't even want to encounter other women. I don't even want to be around her. I'm going to come at an hour that other women are not down at the well. That kind of woman would become a disciple because the word don't care who it infects. Whoever opens up to receive it, the word will come in and get you. Hallelujah. He touched her. 
with the power of his word, like he's touching somebody right now. He's touching you right in that house, right in that situation with the word of God. If you would just lower your pride and admit, give me that water that I thirst not. Some of us are so proud and some of us have been hurt so bad and we use that as a camouflage not to come to church. But I know people who got beat up in the club but they still went back. Come on. I know people who got ripped off with we a dope deal, but they still smoking reefer. Yeah. But when it comes to church, you so hurt, you can't come back to church. Yeah. I know people got ripped off in the steering club, but they still went back to the club. But you say church hurt, hurt. Mm. has kept you from church. Well, guess what? The church is closed. Now you got to meet him at the well. Oh, oh, yes, sir. So if the church hurt is your excuse for not accepting Jesus, guess what? The churches are closed all over the country, but they could not close out Jesus because Jesus doesn't wait to come to a church. Jesus will come down to the well, have a conversation with you about water, and bring the word into your life. Oh, y'all don't hear me, but I feel like preaching to somebody in this place right now. I don't need no church building to preach the word. I preach the word on the back of trucks. I preach the word on the front porch of houses. I preach the word on basketball courts with megaphones in my hand. I don't need a crowd to preach the word. I don't need anybody to help me preach what God called me to preach. I can preach it by myself. Somebody shout the word. Oh, yeah. You see, Jesus didn't need a pulpit or a microphone. He sat by a well and preached a word that was the beginning of the transformation of the entire city of Samaria that ultimately would break the hex and the spells of Simon the sorcerer and liberate Samaria from witchcraft. It started with a woman at the well who humbled herself enough to say, I'm thirsty. This woman was the beginning of the reformation of all of Samaria. It started with a woman. This woman was a seed. She was a seed he sowed that Philip would harvest. Yeah, 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 yeah. For later in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, the Bible says, when persecution arose in Jerusalem, Philip went down to Samaria. Why did God send him to Samaria? To harvest on the seed Jesus had planted about 10 years before. So I talked a little bit about the well. Mm -hmm. And I talked a little bit about the water. And I talked a little about the word. And my fourth one, and I'll be finished, is I want to talk about the worship. Because I really didn't read in my text about the well, and I didn't read in my little text about the water, and I didn't use a part of the text about the word. I only used a part of the text about the worship. Because the argument she's having with Jesus is how do we worship? It's an argument we still have today. We don't worship with instruments in our church. We worship with instruments in our church. We have a Hammond in our church. You can't have church if you don't have a Hammond B3. <laughs> we have a pipe organ in our church. Let me tell you, all of that, all of this, all the mechanics of worship, that's not the issue. Your people worship in the mountain, you know not what. How long can ignorance worship and not be caught? Your people have been worshiping in the mountain for years and never knew who you was worshiping. Ignorance can clap its hands. Ignorance can dance and sing. Ignorance can run up and down the aisle. Just because you're making noise doesn't mean you are a true worshiper. Then Jesus validates the Jews and says, my people know who we worship for salvation is of the Jews. He said, we, we had it right. We were worshiping the right God. He said, but the hour cometh, Ishai, and now is. Look at that phrase. The hour cometh 
and now is. How could it be coming and now is? Jesus said the hour cometh and now is. He, he was saying it was coming because a new Pentecost powerful experience was coming, but he had to say now is because he is my Pentecost. He is my Feast of Unleavened Bread. He is my Feast of Weeks. He is my sacrificial lamb. He is my day star. So he couldn't say he was just coming because he is. I am that I am. The hour cut up and now is that day that ooh, I feel the Holy Ghost that they, they that worship him they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. They must worship him in spirit because God is a spirit. And I told you at the beginning, you thirst for what you are. <laughs> and if I am water, and yet I thirst for water, then God is spirit, and yet he thirsts for spirit. The hour cometh to now is the day that worship God, must worship him in spirit and in truth. If I must worship him in the spirit, and yet God is a spirit, I thirst for what I am. Your God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now you can praise him. <laughs> you can praise him now. You can praise him. You can praise him with your hands. You can praise him with your feet. You can praise him on the high sounding cymbals and the heart. And the you can praise him with earthly stuff, but if you go worship him, worship goes beyond the dimension of the physical. Worship isn't a sound or a noise or a jump or a clap. All of that is how you enter into the gates. You enter into the gates with thanksgiving and the courts with praise. But in order to worship, you got to go in. Into the place where no sound is needed. <laughs> into the place where no harps are played. Into the place where your spirit communes with God. The thing I couldn't understand when I got around holiness people, I was used to people shouting. But in my church I grew up, we shouted because somebody sang or somebody preached us happy. But in a good old fashioned Pentecostal service, they can start shouting and ain't nobody saying nothing. <laughs> They just go to shouting, and it'll sweep all the way across the church, and ain't nothing going on. And I couldn't figure out what is that thing that makes them shout and nobody saying nothing? What is that thing that makes them run up and down the aisle and ain't nobody singing nothing? What is that thing that'll sweep over the church and it'll start over the corner of a church, brother, talking about, holy, ow, and it'll run all over the, y'all don't know nothing about that. Oh, it'll run all over the church till everybody went over in the corner shouting a slave by the Holy Ghost and the preacher didn't preach and the choir didn't sing but something swept the place. God is a spirit and they that worship him Shando must worship him in spirit and in truth in spirit and in truth. And that's why we can preach in an empty room and not be bothered with a handful of people and not be disturbed because what I got didn't come from the people. What I got didn't come from the pews, didn't come from the crowd, didn't come from the noise of the tambourine. What I got came from the Holy Ghost. God is a spirit and they that worship him. This is an elect group of people. It's not like praise. Praise invites everybody. Let everything that have breath praise ye the Lord. But worship is exclusive. <laughs> worship is exclusive. They that worship him means it's not everybody. 
Must. Worship has a criteria. Must. It's not about breathing now. They that worship him must worship him in spirit. Why? Because God is a spirit. And in order to worship him, you got to give him what he is. Come on, come on, come on. If, you, if you're going to quench his thirst, you got to give him what he is. You need water because you came from water and you are water. But God is a spirit. And if you're going to quench his thirst, you have to worship him in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such. What? would make God seek. God is omniscient. Omniscient, omniscience, all science, science, see I knowing, all knowing. God knows everything at the same time. And yet he says the Father seeks. The seeking God. <laughs> Oh, I got to quit. I got to stop. <laughs> oh, I got to stop. Gotta, the seeking God. The first thing Genesis teaches us about God after he had created man is that God is a seeking God. Adam! <laughs> Where art thou? I'm looking for you. The omniscient, all-knowing, all-wise, ancient of days, beginning of wisdom, the God who knows the end from the beginning, it's found seeking in Genesis. He's still seeking in the Gospel of St. John. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. He's searching from the angels of Calvary, laying on Calvary, looking up toward heaven with the ground shaking and the sun refusing to shine and the veil in the temple rent from the top to the bottom. Jesus still says, I thirst. I thirst. <laughs> what does he thirst for that the woman at the well didn't give him? He seeketh such, me and you, to worship him in spirit and in truth. He doesn't seek for you to come to church more. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm a pastor. He, he doesn't need you to come to church all week long. Monday night, we got this, and the, the honeybees are meeting on Tuesday, and the willing to fry chicken is meeting on Wednesday, and the earth and uh, heaven bound is meeting on Friday, and then the, the fried chicken committee is meeting on Thursday. On Saturday morning, he, he, he's not seeking more church. He's not seeking more church. We got churches on every corner. Every church splitting into fragments. Everything. I'm called to start a church. I'm leaving your church so I can start a church. That's like I'm leaving the chicken so I can be a chicken. Preach it. Preach it. <laughs> so now we got all of these churches, but that's not what he's seeking. That's not what he's thirsty for. The Father is seeking somebody who will worship him. In spirit. Have you ever had the worship experience that had no music? Have you ever been driving your car and glory just rise up in your soul and tears start running down your face and ain't nobody preaching, ain't nobody shouting, but you just had an encounter with God? Have you ever been walking around your house and just start shaking your head because all of a sudden the presence of God had come right there in your house? It don't have to be a nice house. How? It can be a one-bedroom apartment. You ain't got no furniture yet. You just got the mattress laying on the floor in the back. If you ever had God make a house call. He's looking for you. All this hoopla and all this noise and all these headlines and shutting down all the restaurants, closing up the library, shut down all the bars, <laughs> send everybody in the house because he's looking for you. He's thirsty for you. Adam! 
I'm going to shut everything down till I find you. I'm going to close out all your hangouts till I find you. I'm going to close down the gym. I know you got a membership. You got to, I'm closing down the gym till I find you. I'm looking for you. I'm looking for you. I'm going to shut out all the noise in your life till I find you. I'm going to bring you off your job till I find you. I'm going to make you sit in the house with nothing to do but think about me till I find you because I want you back. I want your praise back. I want your attention back. I'm going to shut out all your investments. I'm going to close down your 401k. I'm going to shut up your stocks and bonds. I'm going to close it all down because I'm looking for you. I'm looking, 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 I'm looking because I'm thirsty for what your soul would give me if you would come home. The kind of praise that would come out of you is the praise that I want. I don't need no more noise. I don't need no more workshops. I need somebody to worship me in spirit and in truth. I need somebody grateful. I need somebody who's been a slut and a tramp and a whoremonger and a dog. I need somebody who's been locked up in jail. I need a pervert and a freak who will come in and throw themselves down on the altar and say, I'm not even worthy to be here, and I'm just grateful that you let me lift my hands up. He said, that's, that's what I thirst for. I thirst for the broken and the wounded and the hurting and the fragmented and the forlorn and the molested and the raped and the abused and the criticized and the ostracized because there's something that comes out of a broken vessel that prepares my my body. There's something when a vessel is shattered that gets my body ready. There's something that when a vessel cracks in my presence that I thirst for. And I close this Sunday morning message to tell you he's looking for you. Shania, Shania. Yeah. The Father is searching for you. I came to tell you, he's, he's thirsty for how you used to love him and how you used to praise him and how you didn't need all the accruements and all the attention in order to just, 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 just. I appreciate all the stuff you do and all the people you're helping, what a nice, kind person you are, but I, I am thirsty for true worshipers. And if he forgave you for anything, if he brought you out of anything, if he washed you and gave you a second chance, if he put shoes on your feet or gave you a job you never thought you'd have, or opened up a door that other people would be envious to be in, if he ever did anything for you. And you really, 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 really appreciate it. <laughs> if he ever did something for you that you couldn't pay for, that you don't deserve, that you didn't get there by yourself, if you really, 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 really understand the words that are coming out of my mouth. He told me he thirsts for you. He thirsts for you like you thirst for water. He thirsts for you to talk to him in the car on the way home. It used to be just you and him riding together. He thirsts to be company in your house. You say you're suffering because you, you, you're in isolation. You ain't suffering with your TVs and your air conditioning and your dishwashing machine. You know why you're suffering? You're suffering because you're not fulfilling your purpose. God gave you time off to worship him. <laughs> and while you seek the attention of people, God is trying to get your attention. Now do with it what you will. Play me off if you want. <laughs> Ignore it if you want to. It's not even a real message anyway. These are just 
gleanings. Just, just gleanings. Residue. Pieces and parcels. Fragments. Gleanings. From the well. If you did what you were supposed to do right now, you'd be on your knees or on your face or have your hands raised or you gonna let him keep looking you gonna play hide and go seek until you get lost he's looking for you he shook up the whole world to get your attention And now you're too important. You got too many titles. He knows who you really are, girl. Boy, he knows who you really are. Stop it, stop it. He knows about your kids. He's kind of, yeah, he's got. You ought to worship him. It's Sunday. <laughs> you ought to just stop being so important and worship him. Stop being so frustrated and just worship him. Stop trying to straighten people out and just Worship. There's a few in a crowd. Every now and then you run into gleanings of worshipers in rooms of praisers. And so God is on the hunt. And He's looking. He's looking for you. That's what he told me to tell you. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength, my redeemer. God bless you. This is the potter's house. I want to turn our conversation to the millions of people in America right now who have filed for unemployment. The numbers are going up every day who are in crisis, who really don't want to be sitting at home watching TV. They want to be in the workforce. They want to be back in the game. They don't know about the jobs that are available right now. When I think the very first day that we convened as a business leadership group in Dallas, we thought about that things that were most actionable to help those who are most vulnerable and who would be displaced. Let me just tell you in my own life, I remember viscerally at 13 years old when my father lost his job and the kind of vulnerability that we felt as a family, you know, still lingers in my mind today. Will we be okay? You know, will we come through this? Can we keep our home? Can we keep the life that we had become accustomed to? 
we, we partnered uh, across our community and we're partnering with your foundation to actually create an exchange uh, so that the companies that still need workers, whether it's you know, McKesson, which is a huge distributor of pharmaceutical goods, or Domino's Pizza, which may need more delivery drivers because more people are home and need that kind of service, that, that across the spectrum of all of the things available, that we could give people a direct line to those companies to find immediate opportunities if they need them.